Good evening, friends. Well, it's been a week since Boris Johnston uh, gave the announcement that we were, our country was going into lockdown. And... Hi, Nikki. Hi, James. Sorry, I'm looking at the screen. So, yeah, it's been a week. It's been a week since Boris Johnston came on and told us that our country was going into lockdown and what that means for... what that means for so many of us and what it's meant for so many uh, people that have lost their jobs, um, a lot of fear... And what I've been noticing this week is a lot of addictive patterns starting to come to the surface. Some for myself and indeed some for those to whom I've been speaking to, of course, at a metre's distance when I've met them at the park with a dog. The evidence in the supermarkets of alcohol aisles being emptied and the disappearance of food from the shelves is coming from a place of fear, uh, coming from a place of greed. Uh, my friend that I walk the dog with in the morning, she's a postwoman, and she tells me the amount of parcels that they're getting is overwhelming. And even in these times of darkness, uh, consumerism, which is one of capitalists, capitalism's greatest syringes, um, it's astronomical. The 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 local post office isn't managing the 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 load of parcels that they have. So at least at the moment, I'm very fortunate that I'm not in the clutches of alcohol or substance misuse, nor am I a gambler. Uh, but these kind of presenting issues are are up for so many people right now. And when I said I'm not a gambler, I'm not a gambler in the generic term of the world. I, word. I don't bet on football or horses or anything like that. But I am a gambler with my serenity. And, you know, over the years I've noticed that I've went down corridors in my mind that are more constrictive than they are expansive. Um, I've, noticed, I've noticed this week that I'm eating far more sweets, I'm snacking on foods which are not conducive to my best well-being, which in turn feeds my constrictive thinking and thus challenges my serenity. Um, you know, I've started to get into a cycle of guilt where I'm eating sweets or biscuits and then I, I say, right, I'm not going to do that tomorrow again and then I find myself doing that tomorrow again. And... Um, I got a message as well this afternoon which actually prompted me to do this Facebook Live and look at addiction and look at some of the challenges that people might be facing and hopefully what I have to say might be helpful for somebody. But the message that came up on my phone screen today was that I've spent 24% more time on my phone. So it's safe to say that I'm exploring external sources of pursuit in an attempt to manage my inner world. Uh, the things that keep me safe to an extent even sane have closed. My yoga, my gym, my church, the places that are havens for me to connect with others that I value um, in what felt like an absolute instant, just like that, just closed their doors on us. And, um, you know, for so many friends that I have that are in recovery, the sheer despair that they felt, it was overwhelming. I mean, I'm watching what I'm saying because I don't want to be saying this from an agonic perspective, but when the meeting rooms started to close, I had phone calls from people that I know in Newcastle, London, North Lanarkshire, South Lanarkshire, and they were absolutely uh, devastated. But the fellowship, Boom, give them their due. They got the Zoom meetings up. They've got meetings going and they're still in service for people. But um, in the last week, 
all of us or most of us have been forced to pause and to sit still and drop inside to an inner kingdom, which for most of us we've spent our lives trying to avoid. Uh, we've tried to avoid it with any behaviour that we can find to stop us having to navigate that inner world. And uh, in social media and to some of the people that I've been speaking to, the word of the week seems to be cabin, cabin fever. And the language certainly that I'm hearing in the recovery rooms is that those noticing not being able to sit with themselves, the, 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 the difficulty that they have, um, although they're in sobriety, is not being able to sit with themselves. Those itches that are difficult to scratch are coming to the surface. Uh, the very real struggles of managing their compulsive drives, which is really real, uh, very real for most, and which for most of us are all unconscious. Um, I'm pretty lucky in that regard, although I have been overeating and I have been, I completely admit I've been overeating or rather been eating the wrong types of food. And um, I have found myself being on my phone uh, a lot more than normal. Uh, but generally, I the, when those itches appear, I actually quite like them. They're kind of sadomasochistic part to me that enjoys uh, the itch. And I welcome such feelings. And I'm, I feel I'm disciplined well enough in my recovery. Or, <laughs> or rather, my sponsor has a direct enough tongue which guides me uh, to use these very negative feelings as a catalyst for change. I'm really lucky that I've um, got a tremendous sponsor and um, he seems to know me a lot better than I know myself most of the time. And um, as I said, these negative feelings, these negative itches, um, I am directed um, safely to, to actually look at what's going on underneath the surface and um, one way I know which is definitely not going to be a catalyst for change 100% I can assure you that is running from those feelings which is running to the bottle running to you know running to getting a couple of gram of proper running to the pipe microwave crack heroin you know these are not going to be a catalyst for change. They're pretty much just going to keep you going through the same patterns of guilt and shame um, that you've been going through, and that's not helpful. So, um, you know, where, we, where, where it seems that we that are in recovery, we tend to, the minute that we have an uncomfortable feeling is that we run to a behaviour that's going to give us temporary relief, it's going to make us feel better. And nine times out of ten, that behaviour never makes us feel better. So running to a bottle or a pipe, or finding yourself getting angry, even using feelings as a stimuli to take us away from ourselves, or getting ratty, feeling confined. As a wise man once said to me many years ago, he said, uh, you know, the resistance is suffering, only creates more suffering. And resistance to what's going on is definitely futile. You know, as a nation, we're in a period of catastrophic social change. We're watching our institutions crumbling around our feet. The things that have kept us safe, the AA meetings for me, church, um, my yoga class, simple things that I took for granted. And even bigger institutions are crumbling around our feet. Many, many people that I talk to and also I have a personal sense that collectively many of us are feeling that the system that we inhabit is economically, environmentally and psychologically unfeasible. Um, it seems like we're in a time to reevaluate who we are and what values we want to align with and most of those that, that I know want to move to a much fuller system that promotes connection and love as opposed to disconnection and fear. The difficulty with that is that when we've been used to disconnection for so long, right, um, most of us don't have a construct for being connected. And it's like that 
saying the slave, all slaves want freedom. But when you give the slave his freedom, he doesn't know what to do with it. So most of us do not have a construct for being connected and only have an illusion of connection through the clubs or tribes. Uh, tribes seems to be a big thing right now, you know, part of the tribe that we crave to be part of. So we're still looking to be seen and be accepted by an external world. And for most unable to accept love or indeed nurture ourselves, we search for meaning. Uh, we search for meaning and validation reflected in the eyes of others and spend way too much time on looking for external validation and you know, the cars we drive, the house, the partners, the clothes, the clubs, the accessories we chase to give us exclusivi exclusivity. Can I never say that word, exclusivity? Being exclusive. Being exclusive would probably be simpler instead of giving myself a real hard time about that because it's, it's um, nerve-wracking enough speaking into a camera, but it seems to be that that's the way that life's going to be for a while, that we're looking into a camera and speaking to our friends and family and trying to make a connection in a two-dimensional world um, with those that we love, which is a really difficult time. So what this time, what this week certainly taught me is how quickly all, all that can be taken away from us and how quickly we can be forced into a feeling of suffering. We're only a week in and, as I said, people are, I've got cabin fever and I'm really, really struggling. And, you know, when we, when we say addiction, when we talk about addiction... Our mind, our mindset immediately goes to thinking about alcohol and substance. Uh, however, I don't, I don't think of it that way as much. I contemplate addiction as any overwhelming and harmful involvements that we have or any pursuits whatsoever. And that can be an addiction to love or gambling or power-seeking or religious or political zeal. For me, food, certainly work, work's a great distraction for me. Um, not video game playing, but you know I work with a lot of kids that spend so much time uh, playing playing video games, and the internet, surfing, pornography, shopping, the list just goes on and on and on. And um, you know, our system needs us because it thrives on us being addicted. Um, and these addictions can take up just about every aspect of a person's life, whether that's conscious or unconscious, whether it's intellectual or emotional, whether it's behavioural or social, spiritual. And it's just as severe, it really is, it's just as severe as a drug and alcohol addiction can be. Such overwhelming involvements often entail such startling blindness to the harm that the addiction is doing and, um, you know, really aptly called denial and how much denial, we think we're out of denial and then we realise we're still in denial and we don't know what we've got until we've lost it and we don't know what we're doing it until, we don't know what we're doing until we've stopped doing it. And um, many instances of addiction do not involve just a single habit. They, they, they involve, um, and a it's much more complex than has several habits that constitute a single addictive lifestyle. And this week's certainly one of the one of the things that's really showing me is how interconnected everything is, how interconnected um all parts and all strands of our society is so so complexly interwoven with one another. And that's like our addiction. Our addiction has become so complex that, you know, I started my, my journey into recovery 27 years ago and um, I began my journey in April 1993 and I've been completely abstinent from alcohol, even pharmaceutical medication, probably for like 14 years now, I think. And, um, but... But I'm still addicted. I'm still addicted to, I'm still addicted to thinking. I'm still addicted to sugar. I'm still addicted to lots of destructive patterns and certainly addictive uh, destructive thinking. And 
you know, that just shows how complex it is that even in sobriety, you're still an addict. Um, and, you know, the problem can be mild and that only occasionally overwhelms a person's life and that can be short-lived to the middle of the continuum where addicted people strive. Uh, the middle of the continuum, which I really laugh at, is those people that strive to have that double life. And um, when I look back on that, at just how much energy that took uh, to give the appearance of normality. Um, whereas we can go to the severe end of the spectrum with those that are massively in the, con- the, 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 the clutches of heroin and crack cocaine use. And uh, that's destroying a person's conventional lifestyle and causes huge, huge harm to themselves and others and can, re- can reach on unreli- hellish intensity and have fatal consequences to them. So, you know, if we start to get honest with ourselves, I think, and that this week has been about that for a lot of people that I'm speaking to, certainly. Um, but of course, a lot of people that I'm speaking to are in recovery, and um, and a lot of people that I'm speaking to are looking at this kind of stuff because they've found their way into the counselling room or the coaching room. But I feel if we can be honest with ourselves and... Those that are focused on making definitive changes in their lives by using a more rounded explanation of addiction, we're all addicts. And and it's my opinion, rightly or wrongly, that we're all caught in being addicted to is thought and believing that those thoughts that we think are real. And we all suffer from the disease of perception and how we believe our own narrative and needing to believe it to be real and right so that it gives us the right to be right. And, you know, I follow a, I follow a, a Christian perspective um, and I'm, and, you know, probably since the fall in the book of Genesis that when we moved into duality and stepped away from oneness, we've been addicted to the guilt and the shame of our metaphorical nakedness that has, um, which keeps us stuck in a lot of ways. And when I mention, likewise, when I mention the 12 step program, we're immediately drawn to thinking about Alcoholics Anonymous, but really I've had as much success using the program with mental health as I have with using it with um, people in addiction. And and being around step work, which I have been for 27 years going this, a- this April, that it's well entrenched into my thinking. I can't not think about it. I can't, it's, 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 it's became part of me. Um, I'm 47 and the 12 steps have been in my life more than half my life. It's, 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 it's part of who I am now. And, um, and I feel that this is a, a, an excellent time to use step work. And we're better a place to start than step one. And you know, the, the step one is we've admitted we're powerless over alcohol or we've, we're, we're, we've admitted we're powerless over drugs or sex or gambling. But how about just saying we've admitted we're powerless. We're powerless over this situation. There's no point fighting it. We can't fight it. There's nothing we can do about it. It's completely out with our control. We're so used to having control and having things that we want. So we've admitted we're powerless and that our lives have became unmanageable. And in this quiet time, in, 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 in this pause, a lot of us are starting to see just how out of control our life has been with work, with sitting in traffic for an hour and a half in the morning to get to work, to sit in an office for eight hours under fluorescent lights. And I think that Jung, Carol Jung, said it really eloquently. He said, until you make the unconscious conscious, it will totally direct your life and you'll call it fate. As we move further into lockdown, if we do not make the unconscious conscious, the shadows that have been buried in us will start to find their way through the cracks in our walls. For we are our own mansion, we are our own house, we live in our own minds. And Within that mansion, for the most part of it, it's dark. And for what little conscious capacity most of us have, it's a solitary light. 
it's like a candle that flickers in the wind. It moves one way and another, and then another. And all of this stuff, all these hidden parts of ourselves, for which we have managed to hide, we've managed to hide it through work mostly, and through other outlets we've managed to hide from the shadows. We've we've denied that dark aspect of ourselves, and we've put on such a mask. We've managed to hide from it, certainly through work. It's such a great escape. It's such a great structure. It gives us such a great structure work. But when that's taken away, we're finding ourselves becoming very irritable and becoming very cabin fever like, as I said at the beginning. And other outlets lies in the shadows of our mind. Everything else below the false persona lies within the unconscious. And in our mansion, there are many, many rooms, but there's also many gangways, trapdoors, hallways, and indeed a basement. And at all times, it's present. And everything that lies inside, everything that wanders around within us, it's all there. It lives within the house that's me. There are primitive and in some cases even primordial instincts. There's eros and taboos. There's forbidden desires and forbidden inner thoughts. Our inner thoughts that we cannot in daylight are prepared to look at them. Because we've suppressed them, we've suppressed them out of the daylight and we've put them into the darkness. And banished them, banished them out. It is not me, I am a good person. I am a good person, I am a good person, but underneath, underneath we've got urges, we've got taboos, we've got stuff that we don't want to talk about, we don't want to speak about. And those things trick us, they stalk us, and they whisper and they flaunt themselves and make us afraid, and indeed what I'm seeing, they're starting to make people hysterical. And they still hold as much power over us now as they did when we were children, when we were afraid to sleep in the dark. It just came to me there as I was saying that. I used to live down a very dark road. It was a very long and very dark farm track road to get to my house when I was a child. It's interesting that that's just came to my mind as I'm speaking. And um, there was a few friends from school. It would have been probably at primary school, maybe secondary school, I don't know. And um, there was no lights, there was no street lights, and it was probably, I'm guessing, a half mile long single track road, farm track road. And there was a particular part of that road that used to just give everybody that walked along it the chills, it gave us the chills. And I was terrified, I was terrified to walk past this particular part in the journey, and I used to run past it. It wasn't until I was about 21 or maybe even older than 21, that I found out that my grandfather's brother had took his father, my great-grandfather's gun, and blew his head off in that cabin, that little shed. And that was terrifying. But what I've buried in my unconscious, and what so many of us have buried in our unconscious, is just equally as, as, as scary as when we wouldn't sleep in the dark. And the, unconscious is, the unconscious is where the boogeyman lives. And right now, this situation that we are in, collectively, for most, is as scary as the boogeyman. And many of us are afraid right now, many of us are weak. But it's only when we can embrace step one that we can utilise the healing of step two. And there has to be a spiritual aspect to this process. And step two is when we have came to be aware that only a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. So, a few clients had asked me to go through and, goodness, I've got the time right now, but I'm sponsoring more people in Narcotics Anonymous that I stepped away from myself a number of years ago and I stepped away from sponsoring people. I've been asked to sponsor more people in this last week than I have in the last 15 years. And that says something. And it definitely does. We give a thought to those people that are extremely struggling right now and um, the homeless, 
people that are in the clutches of addiction and step out her own way just for a while. But um, step two is probably the step that I've seen more people leave the meeting rooms with because of the word God. And although I follow a Christian perspective now, I didn't back when I first went into the, the, the meeting rooms. And for me, God was coincidence. God was the feeling that I got. My higher power was a feeling that I got when I saw a coincidence. Even this morning when I was walking the dog, I found a 20 pence piece. I could see it up ahead of me. And I started smiling and I had so much gratitude for finding this 20 pence. And when I found that 20 pence, it gave me a feeling inside, a beautiful feeling of gratitude. And for me, that's God. So at this time, step one for a lot of us, accepting that our lives became unmanageable and that this situation has put us into unmanageability. And step two, we came to be aware that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. So I'm going to do a little video. I'm going to be doing this all, all week. And um, for those that are in recovery, I'm going to post them up and we're going to go through the steps. We're going to go through the steps a little bit and hopefully those steps can restore us all to sanity and we can start to connect better with ourselves and others. So I'm going to end that with thank you for watching. Thank you for tuning in and much gratitude. Take care. Have a great night.